Welcome everyone at a new episode of Indie Dev Talks and this time I'm going to talk about Cubifactorium. And I have very great news because this time you can also make a chance to win with a lucky draw a Steam key for Cubifactorium, which is great. So I really want to thank Mirko for this opportunity. And of course, I want to invite him to the studio because I'm going to ask him anything about Cuba Factorium. So have fun, we are going in that. Welcome Mirko to the studio. Hello and um, thank you for inviting me to this interview. You're welcome. Could you like shortly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is uh, Mirko. Um, I'm originally an economist and yeah, but I've always been fascinated by making games and interested in doing so. I quit my day job and now I'm a full-time indie developer. Okay, so are you working alone or do you have like a, like a small studio or how do I need to see that? So I have a small studio. I have uh, one graphic artist who is working for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like two you know, regular employees, and then I have a lot of freelancers, so all kinds of um, help I can get. And how long did you, like, uh, because I, I, I noticed that the beta is quite long already on Steam, right? Like around two years, a year. Uh, so how long have you already worked on Kubi Factorium? So um, the first prototype was about four years ago. Um, and since then I've been continually working on it and uh, did a Kickstarter like two years ago. And um, after the Kickstarter, I put the game on Early Access on Steam and um, it's planned to release this December. So I've made a lot of progress and I uh, feel quite confident about the progress of the game. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the progress. So I think four years is a good time for a game of just complexity. Okay, so you, you because like Kickstarter is kind of, it's, it's hard to start with the Kickstarter, right? So you already worked on the game like for two years and you placed it on Kickstarter? And was that how it went? That is how it went, exactly. So, um, you know, I produced a lot of little videos to showcase the game and certain features I have in mind. And at that time, the game was like super buggy, but it, but it was already sort of playable and you could sort of see like where it was going and what I wanted to do with it and mm -hmm. what, featured it, what features it was going to have. and. Uh, I think that was a good time to do the Kickstarter um, because it was also right away before I quit my day job. So it was a good time to check like are, are people are going to buy it. Uh, so it was like, oh, I hope that these Kickstarters are going to support me. Otherwise, I will be like, I have no job, <laughs> basically. <laughs> well, sort of, sort of. Um, okay. I, I mean, in, in the end, um, Kickstarter is not really for funding your project, it's more like for figuring out if people want to buy it or if there is demand mm -hmm. for your project. Yeah. And it's like a really risk-free way of doing so because all you need to do is, you know, make a little website, make some text, make some, make a little trailer and some, some graphic tidbits. And um, yeah, then you can just without any financial risk really check if people want to buy it and if they don't you can just move on in life and it's okay. Ah, okay so that's your advice on like checking with kickstarter if uh, people are really interested in your id okay yeah actually that's uh, what kickstarter themselves say i think in the faq they say like it's not intended to be like full funding for your project it's more like um, okay. the sort of support thing for you which is also why i don't really get why people are like cheating on their campaign you know by getting their parents to buy in on their project and so on yes. seems a bit dubious in a way mm, yeah that's true but, I, but uh i hear i mean i'm kind of hearing that you are going to launch it officially right when are you going to launch it that is true um in mid-december of this year so the game is mostly done we're currently working on the story which is the last remaining part um and also balancing, polishing, and you know the last bug fixes. But for the most part, the game is done, and um, it's quite playable already. Yeah, yeah, and, it is. Uh, I mean, I could, I could play it. I didn't really encounter, yeah, bugs or what whatsoever. You worked on this alone, right? Or did you already uh, had a team? Um, that is true. I started the prototype alone, and um, my graphic artist started like in the beginning of last year. Oh, last okay. Year. So in the first like. Three years you worked all alone on it? 
Mostly. Um, I mean, I had a friend help me a bit with the graphics and I also had some modders who helped me and some freelancers I paid at that point to help me. Of course, it has its up and lows, I could say. So there were definitely phases where I was not really motivated to do. Um, this is also one of the lessons I learned from it. Um, and usually the problematic phases are where you get sort of stuck, right? Where there is like a big bug you cannot fix or where there are fundamentally gameplay issues you stumble upon or mm -hmm. just where the game is not fun for some reason or you don't really feel like testing or playing it. And um, this definitely happened with Kubi Factorium. But um, yeah, I guess just through um, dedication and desperation and whatever, I got through these phases. How did you make a management game? Because there are all already quite a lot out there. So it's a mix of multiple factors. So first of all, it's a game I'm really interested in, a genre I like playing and um, something I really enjoy spending time with. Then it is also something I can do. I think it's a relatively complex game to make. So there's, I mean, you say there are many management games, but on the other side, there's not so many coming out every year, right? Yeah, there are a few true. big, there are a few big titles, but it's not like a game people can just make in a few months and no. smoke the market <laughs> no, that's, <in> it. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it's like very challenging because you need to like every click needs to connect, and uh, I am sure that there are a lot of. Uh, like inbuilt issues in the programming because i i think if we see your programming list we will get like scared mm. away immediately <laughs> yes yeah it's like the complexity there are so many systems which interact with each other and every interaction brings some possible problems which are really hard to foresee and um yeah, really figuring these out and testing them and solving them can be really tedious. I think yeah, that because the like, there's quite a lot of automatic functions in, in, in the game when you play it. But yeah, then when you are very annoyed as a player when some, sometimes do, something doesn't work and most likely you get that hate on your, on your shoulders often. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I noticed you also already like uh, had like a Discord community next to your Steam uh, community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Discord community is very strong and very helpful and it's very positive. It's like helping out newer players, but also contributing like suggestions. And many people are really, really helpful in uh, making me figure out bugs so they will do testing themselves. That's a good way to get kind of like excite, uh, excited uh, playtesters into your community, right? So um, I try to be really proactive and really fast with it. So usually I look at the Discord and mails and Steam every day. And um, I also make updates to the game every day or every other day. So usually if you report a bug, it will be fixed in like two or three days or so. And I think, okay, okay. <laughs> I think nice. that's, that's really motivating for many people um, also yeah, to exactly. support Max and yeah. see that they're contributing to the to the progress of the game. Yes. About about the game name, I think it's, it, I mean, it, it's per perfect. It's just brilliant. It says where the game comes from, from Germany. It also just explains <laughs> that you are using the art of uh, like kind of pixel art and then combined. But, did you already came up with the name or was it like uh, during the process and you just sticked on that name? I was doing the process. So um, as soon as it became clear that it's going to be a voxel style and, you know, everything is going to have this cube looking aesthetic, it became um, sort of clear that it should be a part of the name. And then I just looked at a lot of words and experimented a bit. I came. I'm not super convinced that it's a super good name because I think for many, especially English speaking people, it's a bit too complicated, <laughs> maybe, or they're more used to shorter words or anything. Okay, but I guess I, I think it's a unique name. Um, it's not like you will get like 50 hits on Google or something. When you no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's genius. Okay, so, but it's so daunting to make a management game already. Like, have you already had experience with that genre or did you just start out of the blue and were like, I'm just going to do this? I made a lot of little prototypes before I did this. Um, my previous game, which was Boss Constructor, was also sort of a simulation game. 
So um, I think it's just that I got a lot of experience uh, through programming, through developing software in general, that mm -hmm. got me to this point where I can um, sort of tackle this type of game. Um, I also made a lot of um, automated tests for Kubi Factorium, which helped a lot. And um, yeah, I mean, in a way, there are these many systems, but each system itself is very, um, you know, easy to explain and it's very straightforward to implement. So, um, yeah, I think it's as, as soon as you are sort of able to deal with the complexity of all these systems coming together, it's quite straightforward to make this type of game. I see, I see. Did you have a kind of a target group in mind when you were designing this game or were you just like, I just want to make a game for myself? Ah, it's a mix of both. <laughs> so um, mostly it's a mix of games I really enjoyed playing myself. Both, as a, But then I also do a lot of market research, of course. I mean, if you spend multiple years on a project, you need to make sure that there is demand for it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I mean, one, one easy way of doing market research is just to look at similar games and see how well they sold. And I think all of these management type games sell really well. Or at least ones which sort of work and which are sort of good. And um, yeah, that also made me confident that there is demand for this type of game. And if I can can make it and I can make it not suck, <laughs> that <laughs> people might be interested in buying it. Yeah, I think you are, you you picked out an interesting niche. I just noticed that also at the Steam there are quite some people that make mods. Uh, was that like... that? you get with the help of the mods you implemented that later in the game or do you just use the mods as like oh yeah the community just created some mods or did you implement on those mods how, how did that go um so um i decided to have mod support very early on in development and um given that it was relatively easy to implement because all you really have to do is make sure that um the players can have the same workflow as you do as a developer. So like how you add an object, for example. And when you have come to that point where you have this parallel workflow for yourself and, and a modder, then all you really need to do is um, give them a way to upload the mod to the Steam Workshop and um, give a little description and something. I think it's really nice for players to add like a little different flavor so for example some people really enjoy the farming element of the game so there are mods which add a lot of different farm crops and things for the player to grow and food to craft um, other people might be more interested in the automation part and might add some mods to enhance this aspect of the game later on so i think it's a really nice way um, for them to customize the experience they have. So the most interaction with the modders is through me supporting them. So when they have issues doing something in the mod, I help them or I test the mod and see what's wrong with it. Oh, okay, um, you provide it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, mostly when they fail, it's because there's a bug in the game. So it's, <laughs> it's sort of something I need to fix anyway. <laughs> okay, but um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And did some exactly. mods end it in the in in the game in the official game or are they always separate? Yeah, um, there are a few where I basically licensed or bought the the mod from the modder. Um, so, for example, there are some uh, sea creatures in the water, some fish and some some seaweed and mm -hmm. so on. And it's just like it's not essential. It's just scenery. It looks really nice, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really nice and I just gave them some money and we were all happy with it. I was wondering, is there a hidden message? Um, okay, so um, we have only recently really begun thinking about the story and <laughs> implementing it. And um, so basically at the start of the project, I didn't really think of that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, then I had this phase where I had all these ideas I wanted to implement, all these things about you know, personal development and growth and, you know, something that gives some value to the player experiencing the story, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, what we came up with in the end, it's like um, basically a story about colonists who are um, fleeing from an island where they exploited all the natural resources and are now, you know, trying to follow an ancient legend which shows them the way to eternal prosperity something so that is the 
idea. And um, yeah, on the course of the journey, they will yeah, meet some characters, experience some things. Yeah. Oh, and then I also wonder about, uh, did you add some Easter eggs in the game that you're excited about? Um, not really. I mean, there are a few, like some funny names for some entities, like a um, like little transport robot called Holly and so on. But it's it's really like very small things. It's not like... First, we need to finish the main game. Okay, and then you're going to add all those random stuff. Okay, I... I... When people aren't looking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <but. laughs> Okay, so what have you learned by making Cube Factorium? So I think I put too much uh, effort on, you know, implementing all the features I want to have and all the technical problems. And I ended up spending a lot of energy in these really specific technical things from the late game when like other parts of the game were not finished yet and mm -hmm. i think that was both a problem for me playtesting it as well as the players playing it and i think it also resulted in many negative reviews i had i mean it's still mostly positive and so on but it could be much more positive if i had focused on being like okay so this part is finished now yeah, right, I think that's where like mostly the struggles people were saying like this is still bad up. <laughs> like, that's what I read. <laughs> so is there an element of the game you're really proud of? Mm, I think one thing I'm I'm sort of proud of is I guess that it just works. I mean it was just very yeah. complicated to make and there are not so many games out there like that and Having done that and being at a point where it's like really fun and playable and where like the the last bug is on the horizon, so to speak, that is something I'm I'm quite happy with. Um, and also I think the the process of making the game is very streamlined and very efficient. So um, like I said, there's usually a patch every day or every other day, and I think it's. Um, it's a very helpful that I have this very streamlined pipeline of automated tests, automated deployment, and you know, just this very, mm -hmm. very short way between um, getting a report of a bug, um, identifying, introducing it, fixing it, and putting it in the game. I think yeah, I think fine. just uh, adding on that, I think you kind of made it kind of cute, which I think is very interesting because I've never seen it. Like Factorium, uh, or Factorio is also doing kind of similar thing. But that looks like really, I mean, for, for someone like me, I would not be that interested in it. Uh, maybe just for like mm -hmm. the big niche people, yes. But this one is also, I think, feels already for like people that are not really into it. Uh, like, oh, this, this mm -hmm. looks cute. Oh, I can combine stuff. So I think that's really something you add on the market. But, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's okay. a, it's a feed, feedback I get from many players like that Factorio is a bit too overwhelming for them and they want a bit more of a chill experience, a bit of a laid back experience. And um, yeah, I think in retrospect, this is also something I should have focused more on, like thinking about what is the experience people are looking for. So, for example, I spent a lot of energy implementing a combat system into the game, which um, never really quite turned out the way I wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I think like most people don't even expect this. Like most no, people I don't need not... a combat system. No, because in the first levels, you just always like, you go somewhere with your campfires to meet other people and then they join, right? So it feels really weird that exactly. suddenly you need to attack them, right? So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think I, I could have figured that out earlier, but I think I also got tricked like every other game has like a combat system in it, yeah, right? The, yeah, the Settlers and Anno and yes. all of them have some sort of combat. Yeah, but then they play other games, right? If they want to fight on islands. <laughs> so. Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, also just making a combat system, which is really good, is really, really hard. I mean, um, yeah. if you expect like, for example, StarCraft 2 level of um, unit control and movement and balance and everything that's really, really hard to implement. And as soon as you add something to a game, people will sort of look at it and judge it whether it's good or not. Right? Yeah, and then it needs to be also like need to most likely you can now develop tools 
But then you also need to develop swords and, and, and shields and that kind of stuff. It could enhance the gameplay, but it also adds a lot more in the manufacturer uh, way to, to build. So, yeah. And then mm -hmm. it's indeed balancing that off. It's, it's like almost a game on itself. <laughs> so it yeah. will take most likely extra two years. <laughs> so. One problem I ended up with, for example, is that um, there wasn't really anything stopping you from just producing a huge amount of combat robots. And they're just sweeping through the map. So there was no real challenge once you have all of them. You can just, you know, mm. A move yourself across the map. And that's not really any adding anything to the gameplay. Right? Yeah, that, that, that just makes you feel overpowered. But when you have that overpowerment, then you suddenly don't like the game anymore. That's always like, I when I play a game, I just, I'm an achiever. Uh, so I just always go for like, oh, how to get it in the best way. But then I have the best way and then I'm like, oh, oh, but now it's not fun anymore. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> so I, I just mm -hmm. kill my own fun basically in that way. So yeah. So if you have worked so long on the game, do you still like, like to play it? Or in like sometimes that you're like, ah, now I'm going to play it. Or is it like, oh no, it's, it feels like work. Um. Actually, it felt like work until about two months ago and testing one particular mission of the campaign. Got sort of addicted to playing this one mission of my own <laughs> game. Oh, and that was sort of the sign. turning point. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. a very good sign as a developer. Okay, excited. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like it, it's actually a really, really hard question like what makes a game fun and why a game is fun or why not. and. I think that is what something many developers struggle with at some point in the in the development of a game. They come to a point where the game is not fun and they don't really know why. And that's like really yeah, terrifying a, in a way. That's a challenge. I mean, how to get the flow and like you need to basically focus on your target audience because the other, everyone has a different flow and otherwise you just get something like there's nothing that everyone likes. That's that's kind of also yeah. a thing yeah. in our industry. Uh, I think. Um, oh, <laughs> yes. So, what do you think? so so for Kobe Factorum, I think the solution was that um, there was just a huge amount of paper cuts, like a huge amount of things that were a bit balanced, took a bit too long or too short, or were unclear in the UI, or it was too complicated to make something, I needed to click a lot, or... Um, and it was just, I think, the sum of all these little, little problems, which are individually not so problematic, but in a sum, it made the game a bit tedious and unclear, and just getting through that, I think, caused it to be fun again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just played the the last version, so I I don't really had that struggles with your first beta versions, and uh, so I didn't notice that that much. Um, oh, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm lucky. Yes. <laughs> what was the biggest like bug that you were like, oh my gosh, what did or what have I done? What was that? Um, I think. The biggest bug is um, that the game no longer works on macOS. And um, that is, I think, not really due to my making. It's just that the latest Unity version does no longer work when I export it to Mac. And, uh, you know, I reported it to them. They say, you know, they can confirm it. It's a, it's a bug, uh, but um, I think not many developers are concerned by it, so they don't really... <laughs> seem too interested in fixing it so i mean that was sort of the biggest problem i had so far i think in that regard because um i mean i offered the game for mac right and so if you bought the game on mac it's no longer updated which is of course Ooh, a problem that's... and uh, but did you, you fix know, it or is it like just like oh mac users <laughs> just don't play this game <laughs> well okay so Obviously, this was something causing a lot of anxiety for a long time, because mm -hmm. like you said, like if you bought it for Mac, like what do you really do, right? So what I did now is basically I wrote a big post explaining it, what happened, uh, why I did, what, um, 
what unit you did and so on. Mm -hmm. I contacted Valve and tell them, that, you know, if people bought the Mac version and want to refund it because of them, please be generous about it. Mm -hmm. There are also ways like you can use like an emulator software to play the, the Windows version on Mac and so on. So, you know, I spent all this energy, you know, I rented a MacBook to do all this testing on Mac and spent like so much time and energy on it. And um, I thought like, oh, this is going to be so terrible and people will hate me for doing it and, and so on. And then I, I do this, I post this and nothing happens. It's so strange. Like not a single player responded to it or messaged me for support or complained about it. It's just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I that think was really strange. People in your niche maybe don't use a Mac. Well, I, I think it's always about 5% or so Mac users. But, but uh, in a way, it was very enlightening because, you know, the, the big thing that you're so afraid of um, and are so anxious about, uh, maybe nobody cares. <laughs> 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 yes, and then so then some small thing that you were like, oh, it's so small, and then they just blow up. <laughs> Basically, that's right. Yeah, it's hard to predict. And, yes, and, and you cannot really do something about those, right? Because yeah. you cannot anticipate the things which you don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. so I mean, my channel is mostly for starters in the game industry. Do you maybe have some advice for starters? I think it it depends a lot on which direction you want to go in. So if you want to work in a big company, I think it's best to really focus on one specific thing or one specific skill set and build your portfolio towards that. So um, just for example, if you want to work at a really big company like Blizzard or so, you want to not be a generalist, but you want to be really specific about one thing. So for example, if you are a 3D artist, you could build a portfolio just around furniture, for example, Yeah. because then you will be really good at making furniture. You will have like really good, put, um, a really good portfolio of high quality, realistic furniture of all types and periods and so on. Um, and I think that is your best bet to get into a big studio. Um, otherwise, if you want to go indie or want to make your own thing or your own studio, I think I would strongly recommend um, getting a day job for at least 50 or 60 percent of the time. It's got a well, job. <laughs> yeah, well, just, just because then you have the freedom to just work on your thing, right? You're not yeah. under pressure to pay your bills. And mm, uh, it also yeah. gives you like a very natural rhythm to, to work and to, to meet other people, to have a social circle. You also have some money maybe to, to hire freelancers or buy assets if you need them. And it's just way more chill than going all in and uh, yeah, that's, on, I mean, basically, I, I did the same. I mean, I have also a part-time job next to my YouTube career because otherwise it feels so much stress because you need to survive, right, in a way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, we still yeah. need to, to, like, have the electricity to turn on, the, on, on your computer and have something to eat. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, and some other general advice. Um, I mean, this applies to sort of every job mm -hmm. or whatever um i think like physical fitness is very important i neglect neglected this a lot but um i think a lot of people being anxious or having depression or other types of problems is because just they are physically weak and um, biologically they would just be in danger all the time or would mm -hmm. just die from something so i think there's just this aspect um which is important yeah, I mean, when you sport, like you get some happiness, uh, adrenaline, so that's that makes mm -hmm. you more happy, I guess. And it also gets you out of the project, so you can think about it yeah. in a different environment. And often, then you just have a suddenly amazing idea or a solution to yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah I agree on that. And I, th I think one other thing that helped me a lot is meditation. So I, I meditate a lot, and I think um, mm -hmm. being in like a creative industry like we are, it's it's not so much about, you know, producing a lot of stuff. It's about really being focused when you do something and really think about it, maybe see something other people don't. And I think meditation can help a lot when, when doing that. Yeah. 
So also like uh, what is always a, a struggle for starters is the marketing. Like how did you, like was it like the Kickstarter just started your marketing or was it like before or how did you, how did you mm -hmm. manage to market your game? Okay, so um, I think marketing is often, you know, restricted to just being about advertising and PR and so on. But I think marketing is right from the beginning when you think about mm -hmm. what's target audience and where is your target audience, what does it want, uh, what does it react to and so on. And I think like a Kickstarter campaign is like a really good way to figure that out. Like, is there a target audience for your game? What type of videos does it like, for example? What type of information does it respond to? And you, if, if you have that, it's, I mean, sort of easy, I guess, to, to make a store page that is attractive for this target audience. And yeah, so I did a little bit of marketing in terms of Facebook advertisement. Um, I experimented a bit with YouTube and other things, but um, well, I mean, Facebook was sort of successful, the rest not so much, but um, yeah, that is what I focus mostly. And I mean, in my experience, like whatever you do, the majority of the customers will still come from Steam organic users, right? So people seeing the game on Steam or having it recommended for them. And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair enough. Um, so I think that's that's just a limit to how much you can really do if if the game is not attractive to the people you want to reach. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Would you have some last advice for like for all of us? <laughs> One last advice for all of us. Yes. Um. Yeah. I mean, just um, I I've been working in like other industries uh, before as an economist and. Um, I think we can be just really grateful to be able to work on something that is creative, that is interesting and fun for other people where we can contribute to, you know, making someone's life a bit better. And um, I think that is something to be really grateful for. And um, I think when you keep that in mind, it gives you a lot of motivation to work on your project. and. Um, yeah, I think also it's a really nice industry to work in. Like when you talk to other people at a meetup or at at a convention or so, the people are so helpful and there is so little, you know, competition and, you know, envy and something which I experienced in other, um, other lines of business. But I think the gaming industry is really, really nice. Yeah, do you... If you can manage to get a hold in, it's really good. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Do you uh, feel that like your economist uh, like history influenced also your game or like the way how you approach your game development? Mm, I think it helped me in the way that um, it's very natural for me to think about the business side of making a game, right? About project planning, about um, expenses and cash flow and also like the importance of marketing, of um, having a target audience and so on. Um, I feel like oftentimes um, artists are very much captured by this archetype of the poor artist who is following his or her vision without regardless of what the market wants. And uh, I think that's not very helpful. So I think it gave me a good and a healthy um, perspective on the business side of things. And I think that helped me a lot. Okay, I think we kind of covered everything. So I'm going to like the more exciting thing for s some of you guys. Uh, if you want to like win uh, the Steam key, uh, just uh, on the comments, tell me like how your dream island would look like. And uh, then maybe like, then I will pick one of you guys with a lucky draw and then I will send uh, the Steam key. And that will be on like next, um, Next interview, I will uh, notice who has won the key. So yeah. So uh, Mirko, thank awesome. you very much for like <laughs> having this opportunity. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for having me. Yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to having you here. I mean, your game is really inspiring and interesting. It's something totally, totally new, basically. So yeah, I really like it. Thank you a lot. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, much success with your YouTube channel. 
and take care. Thanks. <laughs> okay. See you. <laughs> See you. Bye-bye.